Well, hello, everybody. This is the Empirical Audio File. You know, I was just watching a video just the other day. It was a nice video from somebody who, uh, I think they make videos like every single day, but they were talking about used equipment that you really shouldn't buy used equipment. And my first real good stereo was used equipment that I had when I was younger. And I think most people do that or have bought used equipment. Now, not every time something's going to go 100% right. If you buy used equipment, something could go wrong. But basically, that's what his video was about. You buy used equipment, you take your chances on the equipment. You should have it looked at by a professional if you buy older used equipment and have them look at it, which will escalate the price. And he gave an example like uh, if you're buying something for $3,000, well, for $3,000, you might as well put it towards something new. You know, and I understood what he meant about that. But in the term of like the $3,000, maybe he could be, he was talking about like if you wanted to go with real old equipment from the 70s, like uh, receivers. Now, a $3,000 receiver is going to be one that's been looked at, gone over. But he was kind of saying, even though it's been gone over, you know, something could still go wrong being so old. And of course, that's very true. But then again, I have some old radios you know, made from the 1930s, it still worked. You know, so yes, anything can go bad with a piece of stereo equipment, even though you pay a lot for it if it's used. But in the same term, he, he gave an example, like, for example, uh, speakers. He said, like, you buy old speakers and the surround to the, to the speaker, uh, and you got the speaker cone, and they made them out of foam, and the foam rot away, and therefore you have to redo the cones of the speaker. And of course, if you look at like these old LTEX here next to me, or you look at a pair of old Tenoys, or a pair of old Clips, speakers are still just as good as they were the day they were bought. Like you look at this, the surround on, on this LTEC here, just as good as the day it was bought. And that's because they didn't cheap out. And if you remember, speaker manufacturers started cheaping out on their speakers by putting foam around the cone. And, you know, I looked at that. Now, Klipsch never did it. LTEC never did it. A lot of companies didn't use foam, but a lot did, started using foam on all their speakers and well-known speakers. And that foam uh, didn't last, and it would crack and get brittle over time and couldn't stand the test of time. Well, if you think about it, that was only done for cheapness. It was inexpensive then to go the route of like this LTEC that looks just as good as the day it was made. I have old speakers from 1910, 1920s, and they're still as good as the day they were made back then because they use a paper instead of, uh, you know, foam because they didn't make them that way. So they still work today. They're not cracked. They're not breaking up. There's nothing wrong with them because they were taken care of and left in a, you know, dry spot where it wasn't high humidity or anything else. But the foam ones, no, after a few years, they dried up, that foam dried up and the speakers started cracking. So I understood what he was saying there, but a speaker that is well-made there's going to be nothing wrong with it over time, period. There's just not going, there's not that much in there. And the crossover, yeah, maybe you may want to say, well, I have to replace the caps or something like that. But 
sometimes the caps are still very good. There's nothing wrong with them. You'll have to test out to see if the caps are any good before you would even replace them, even on older speakers. But that was because they cheaped out. So now let's look at what he was saying, and I tried to understand clearly what he was saying. So if, uh, for example, you take the receiver, those were cheap. You have to remember, back in the days, they were expensive back in the day, but they weren't made as good as the real good gear was made. They were mass-produced by a very large company who produced thousands and thousands of them. And I can understand where the parts in there are not the top-notch, highest-grade parts. And that goes with your Samsuis, your Pioneers, your Morants. In fact, Morants sold out the Super Scope and Superscope made crap. Okay, they did not make anything any good. Superscope did not. And it was an audiophile thing that, yeah, Morant sold out to Superscope, and they don't make anything as good as Morant used to make it because they cheaped out. But anyway, the point I'm getting to is those receivers were not meant to be the top line. During the 70s, then companies came out, Mark Levinston, Conrad Johnson, Jeff Rowland. These names, and, and of course you had your Max. Those companies started using high-end capacitors and everything else inside and circuit boards and everything else in their equipment. So... As he was talking, I think he realized because he sells Jeff Rowland that he needs to backpedal a little bit because by what he was saying, that if you wanted to buy an older piece of Jeff Rowland, uh, it's not worth buying unless you get it checked out and everything. It's not worth buying basically is what I was taking. And he kind of backpedaled and said, well, you know, if you buy the good stuff like Mark Levinston or, or you know, Cello or, or you know, Jeff Rowland, <clears throat> that that equipment uh, was worth it because they use such good, you know, insides in them. Their capacitors and everything else were far better than what was used in the cheaper Japanese equipment. Now, I'm not talking about Accuphase. I'm talking about, you know, your Marantz and your Pioneer, Samsui, stuff like that. Those receivers, they were for the masses. Those, that, those, are, that, those pieces of equipment were all for the masses. And today they've become a big thing. I, I guess they're a big thing because nostalgic. But uh, to be honest with you, they, that's something I would not pay $3,000 for, even if someone went over it and looked over it. Uh, maybe if you had a, a Macintosh receiver, I would pay that much if it was looked over because it was a Mac, and Mac uses better insights. You know, all their electronics are going to be far, far better, but Mac cost a lot of money back then compared to any of the other receivers that were out there. I'm just saying. So I think the tactic of trying to scare people that use equipment as it gets older gets worse. That really depends on the time period it was made, the quality, like the old Morants, like from the 60s, uh, the older tube and the older uh, Macintosh, they were built very well. There's no doubt that they were built of high quality back then and still is. Not Morantz, but Mac. They still make high quality. In fact, Mac has even made the claim that people have been using their equipment for 35 years and not one thing has been wrong with them. But he did bring up some points that you could buy mono blocks. And one of the monoblocks could be off by a few decibels and you won't even know it. 
that they're not matched anymore because they are so old. Makes sense what he's saying. But that shouldn't scare people to buy high end. And I'm, you know, quoting that high end older equipment like like this Conrad Johnson or something, because it was made so well back in its day. And I've known people to buy 30-year-old Conrad Johnson. I know, and they have tested out the capacitors and everything else and said they didn't find anything wrong. Now, a lot of these people who are changing these capacitors and stuff, thinking that they're going to try to improve or put better capacitors in that we have today than was in the day of when this equipment was made. Um, I don't know. I would have to hear something like that to sonically give it a test to see what they have done, if it actually is better than how they originally made it. You know, that's all subjective. Just like the Altex here next to me. People would said, oh, you should replace the capacitor. Other people said, don't replace the capacitor. Something with the LTEC capacitor were great capacitors and don't replace them if they don't need to be replaced. So you have two caps there. One saying replace them, others saying do not replace them because you will change the sonic characteristic of the speaker. If you want to change it, because it's awful hard to change it and go back, you know, but once it's changed, it's changed unless you're going to unsolder everything and put it back. But your sonic memory is very short to try to remember what you heard and what you're changing and is it really better. Uh, that's one thing that audiophiles have to realize, especially if you're new. Your sonic memory is very, very short, very short. And that's why they tell you when you A-B something, don't put a lot of something that you have to remember and then switch it over to what you're comparing it with and try to do it again. Only listen to a little bit and then listen to a little bit off the other system. Don't try to do a lot. Don't try to listen to a whole song because your sonic memory is very short and your sonic memory may not remember what you heard in the very beginning. It has already forgotten, and when you listen to the other system, you may not have re recall of what you heard. That's very, very common. That's been written about in uh, uh, stereophile magazines, Absolute Sound, that the sonic memory is very, very short. So I just thought I would just make this video to let everybody know, you don't have to be scared of good equipment. Would I buy an older Jeff Rowland or an older Mark Levinson in a heartbeat? It would, that stuff was made like a tank. Uh, maybe an old Krell made of very high quality. No problems at all. Uh, and, and the proof is when I did the review on the Macintosh D to A converter, and converted it and listened and compared it to the Premier 9. I did not hear a big, huge sonic difference for something that's almost 30 years old compared to brand new, where I would say, wow, it, it literally baffled me. It was so good. No. And that's 29 years later. I did not sonically hear. In fact, even to this day, I prefer to listen to the Premier 9 D to A converter than I do the Macintosh D to A converter. The only big thing about that is it plays uh, SHCDs, where the Premier 9 does not. But sonic-wise, I like the way the Premier 9 sounds. Now, I don't care what anybody says about brand new chips, uh, capacitors. I don't care. What I judge things on is my ears. That's how I listen to stuff. What am I hearing? I'm comparing A with B. I don't care if people are going to say, yeah, but the Macintosh has the newest chip. 
So what? Who cares? I don't care. I'm just A, B, and M, and I've just told you during that review exactly what I heard and exactly what I felt and what was better sonically that pleased me more than the Macintosh. Not that it was bad, but I just prefer the Premier 9, even though it has an older chip, because of the way it was designed to begin with. I mean, the Mac D-Day converter is very good, but you really see the workmanship in a Premier 9 of what Conrad Johnson did, and it's a tube D-A converter, but you can really see the huge difference in workmanship between that and the brand new D-A converter that Macintosh made. But it can be upgraded with a little board, you know, so that's what I'm basically trying to say that uh, if the equipment has been used and it sounds good and there's no problem with it, you could probably take a safe bet. He did say something, know who you're buying from. And that's absolute. Know who you're buying from. Trust the person you are buying your equipment. A lot of people dump equipment out like he mentioned, and they've been in there screwing around put new caps in, new resistors or whatever, and they don't know what they're doing. And now they're dumping that piece of equipment back on the market because they screwed up or they don't like it. Or after they did all that work, they realize that sonically it doesn't sound as good as what it was. So, and he did mention that. you got to watch. you got to know who's working on that equipment and trust them that what they're doing, they know what they're doing before they screw around with something and mess it up. So one thing, if you are going to buy used equipment, make sure it has a guarantee that it has not been screwed around with by the hobbyists, or if it has been fixed, that it's been fixed by a reputable dealer. Like, let's say a Mac. It's bad. Well, did they send it off to Mac and get it fixed? Or did they send it to their local Joe Blow down the street? And, oh, yeah, you know, I went, uh, I went saw somebody fix a, you know, amplifier. Uh, let me try to fix it. You know, are you going to trust that? Make, you know, look at it this way. Let, okay, I got the best. Look at it this way. When you get a Rolex and you go to have it fixed or repaired, you better make sure you take it back to Rolex or a reputable dealer that is a Rolex representative certified by Rolex to work on your watch. And they give you a certificate that they are a dealer, a reputable dealer to work on that Rolex watch without sending it back to Switzerland. You know, otherwise it's worth nothing. If someone says, oh, I have a Rolex and I got it fixed, who would you get it fixed by? Where's the certificate? Where's the guarantee to that watch? You know, nobody will touch it because if Joe Blow worked on it, and you see a lot of YouTube videos where people are working on watches and you'll see them working on Rolex, that's no good. That's no good. You, I would not buy a watch from somebody on YouTube fixing a Rolex. Unless they are Rolex certified, because that will keep the value of that. That's the same way with equipment like this. You got, you get your equipment, it's older. If you have a problem, you contact them or you get someone who's certified to work on that equipment. You're not trying to be mean or anything else to the tech, but if they're not certified to work on the equipment and they're working on it and it's a Mac or something, to me, it doesn't hold its value. But if someone says, yeah, I sent this back to Macintosh and they worked on it, that holds more water to me than them sending it off to Joe Blow to work on it. That's all I'm saying. Make sure you use a little bit of your smarts when people are working on it. I've seen that too much people selling equipment 
and you can see scratch marks in it and everything else. And oh, now they're dumping it. Yeah, I could see why you're dumping it, but you're dumping it at expensive price after you screwed it up. I, I can see where the guy was coming with this video. So Jeff Rowland, you can send back Jeff Rowland equipment to Jeff Rowland. That carries more clout than Joe Blow down the street who's going to work on electronics. Okay. It holds more water with that certificate saying, I had problems with this amp. I sent it back to Jeff Rowland, paid the money. Here it is. I would say, yes, that, that holds more water than, oh, I sent it off to this guy. Mm, no, it's false. So just be cautious if you are not 100% sure of something that's older, don't buy it. Just walk away from it. Call it a day. Okay, so until next time, that's my little rant. I, I thought his video was very good, but I wanted to give my two cents in it from my experience with buying used equipment of how I see people can get ripped off because hobbyists are digging into equipment that they shouldn't be digging into saying, well, I changed the caps or I, that piece of equipment to me is worthless. It is completely worthless. If they said, oh, well, I changed the caps because it needed new, yeah, who are you? You're nobody. You know, don't touch it. Let them keep their equipment that they worked on because now to me, that piece of equipment is garbage. I don't care what kind of engineer he is or how good of electronics he is, send it back. It's the same way with audio research. They got a whole line of equipment that they're working on. Then you get a certificate from audio research that we fixed this piece of material or this equipment. We fixed it. We know what we're doing, you know, and pay the price that having somebody work on it that you're not sure what they're doing. You know, you're just going on trust. I could see what he means. To me, I'd rather take my 3000 and put it towards something new. So until next time, this is the Empirical Audio File. And uh, there's shows coming up, by the way. February is the Tampa show. And April is the show in Chicago. So until next time, happy listening.